Finding the Light by Alec Heflin, Hannah Ruthier, Emily O'Quinn, and Chelsea West. Illustrated by Tori Rafferty. The light breeze shifted through the dead grasses of the African savanna. It was late afternoon, and the sun would soon be touching the earth. The ground was dry and hard. The rains hadn't visited them in weeks. Beneath the tall grasses, the hushed giggles of a young boy and his lion friend could be heard. Vroom, vroom, Zico mumbled while pushing around his wooden car. Hey, this is different. What's this one? Zico said while picking up an unfamiliar object. Oh, Amanzi said. That one just came from the village over. My father traded our best goat for it. Said they called it a flashlight? Amanzi paused. Watch what it does. He picked up the flashlight, flicked the switch up, and shook it around near Zico's face. Ah! Zico screamed and covered his eyes, jumped back from the strange and powerful light. That one hurts my eyes. I don't like that one at all, Zico exclaimed. I'm sorry, Zico. I didn't mean to scare you. Zico! The lion heard his name being called in the distance, and then again, this time angrier. Zico! That's my dad, Zico explained. He sounds mad. I should probably go. Same time tomorrow, Amanzi asked. Tomorrow, Zico responded with a smile on his face. Amanzi and Zico started packing up their toys and headed in opposite directions back towards their homes. Gather around, hunters. We are set to leave immediately. Timu's powerful roar echoed around the lions. Food had been scarce for weeks, and everyone had grown hungry and impatient waiting for a good kill. Zico could feel his small, furry belly rumbling. I'm so hungry, I could eat a whole water buffalo, Zico said to his father. Quiet, Zico. We'll be back soon with food. Till then, be patient and behave for your mother. Can you do that for me? Timu placed his giant paw in the center of Zico's head. Yes, I'll be good, a teethy grin spread across Zico's face. With that, Timu rounded up the lionesses and off they went. At first, they tried to find a zebra, for they knew that the zebras loved to frequent the nearby water hole, but with that having dried up weeks ago, they made another choice. What if we took the giant bull the people have? That could feed us for days, one of the lionesses chimed in. Other lionesses grumbled in agreement. We all know the risks that come with hunting the people's cattle. Do we really want to take their prize bull? Timu asked. The lionesses looked around at one another, and after some time, were all in agreement to make the hunt. They waited until the stars filled the sky, and the crickets chirped in a loud chorus. They crept so quietly into the cattle pen that their paws could not be heard on the hard ground. Working quickly, and as a team, the hunt was successful. They took the bull down in just minutes. Filled with a sense of accomplishment, Timu and the lionesses returned to the pride. Everyone ate until their bellies were fat and their tongues flopped out of their mouths in giant yawns. Zico couldn't help but wonder if this was the same bull he had seen while he was playing with Amanzi close to the village but the feeling of his outstretched belly was more satisfying. There was peace in the air for the first time in a while, but what the lions didn't know was how soon that peace would be destroyed. Papula awoke to the head rancher screaming into his bedroom. Chief, chief, the bull from the east pasture is missing. How could this be? He sprung out of bed, quickly throwing on a robe to go check the pasture for himself. At first glance, he noticed the fence was still in good condition and no signs of escape, But there in the corner of the corral, under the trees, a deep, red-stained puddle caught his attention. A blood trail that led straight out of the village and over the hill. We will follow this trail, Papula said with intent. We will find the heartless people who did this, and we will take revenge for our sacred bull. The village prepared for payback. Papula gathered twenty of the strongest Morans and ordered them to sharpen their spears. Before leaving, he looked at Amanzi and said, Son, I will be back soon. Amanzi stood frozen with fear, thinking what might become of his father as he watched the angry mob disappear into the sunset. Papula followed the blood trail well into the darkness until he heard loud snarls and snores coming from behind a mountain of rocks. Stop! Did you hear that? He whispered as he threw up his hands at the others. Yes, sir. It sounded like a lion, one of the Morans proclaimed. This must be the den of the nearby prod we've spotted in passings. Papula and the Morans then realized that it wasn't another tribe that had stolen their bull. It was the pride of lions. As they traveled to a higher vantage point, they saw it. The lion's lair. They were all sound asleep, and it seemed like the perfect time to strike. Papula surveyed the pride carefully and knew he could not take on all of the lions. But through his battle experience and teachings from his father, he knew that to dismantle the group, you have to take out the leader. And it was easy to spot him. One male stood out in particular. He was the biggest lion on the highest rock. That must be him, Papula thought to himself. Men, spears ready, Papula loudly whispered. He pointed to the massive lion to show the warriors who to aim for. Papula slowly put up one finger, then a second finger, 
and on the count of three, all the spheres were lost in the night sky. There was a loud grunt from the lion, loud enough to wake the others, and they all ran to check on their leader. Quick, let's get out of here. Move. The tribe quickly and quietly scurried back into their village without being detected. When Papula and his fellow Marans made it back to the village, he was immediately addressed by his son. Did you find the people who killed our bull? Amanzi asked. It was the pride of lions, son, and it will keep happening as long as the lions are near. We must make sure the lions never come back here, he said angrily. Amanzi felt his stomach drop. Did they kill Zico? Why would lions kill our bull? I need to go find Zico. He kept his thoughts to himself. That morning, he would go to their regular meeting spot and wait for him, but Zico would never come. The night Zico's father died will be one he remembers for many years. He knew that by discovering that it was the local Maasai people who killed his father in retaliation over their bull, that he and Amanzi would no longer be friends. As he grew into the position of king of the pride, he acquired a pent-up rage for the people, and he continued to use their livestock as a constant source of food for his pride. Years went by, and the Maasai tribe and the lions fought ferociously. The lions would steal a goat, and the Maasai would take the revenge. Zico and Amanzi were now mortal enemies that hadn't spoken since Timu's death. People, livestock, and lions were dying too often, and there seemed to be no end in sight. One day, while fending off a lion attack, Papula suffered a nasty bite to his midsection, and it was not healing well. All around hushed whispers of what had happened hung in the air like a heavy fog. Amanzi walked over to the hut and pushed back the grassy curtain. Inside, he saw his mother, her face damp with tears, clutching his father's hand. Amanzi swallowed hard. He could feel the tears pulling in his eyes, but he knew he had to be strong. Walking over to his father, he saw a slow, weak smile spread across his worn face. My son, Papula muttered. Well, come closer, my boy. You look worse than I do with that expression, Papula lightheartedly laughed. Father, what is going to happen? Sometimes, son, there are things you can't prepare for. Life is full of unexpected twists and turns, and we don't always know how to handle them. I know you weren't ready to take on the role as chief. He placed his hand on his son's shoulder. But you are more ready than you know. From the moment you were born, I knew you'd be a fighter. You will lead our people with the courage of a lion, but in order to do so, you must make a few changes. Kneeling down at his Papula's bedside, he asked, What are these changes? Clearing his throat, Papula continued, The Maasai and the lions have lived in harmony for generations before now. They are the spirit of our people. We have always shared a respect with the beast. But father, they have hurt you, Amanzi objected. They don't deserve our respect. He began to stand, but Bapula grabbed his arm. Listen, my son, I know that when you are wronged, you first believe the answer is revenge, but this is not the Maasai way. I remember as a young boy watching the lions in the distance as they flicked their tails and yawned in the hot sun. I remember thinking how peaceful they looked. We have to find this peace once more, or I fear our people have only seen the beginning of the lives that will be lost. I don't think our people will listen to me, muttered Amanzi. Nonsense. You are their chief now. Some may not agree, but if you find this balance once more, you will be thanked for years to come. I believe in you, Amanzi. Leaning forward, Amanzi hugged Papula. I will make you proud, father. Amanzi stayed with Papula until the sun touched the dusty savanna. When the stars lit the sky, Amanzi watched as his father drifted into a deep slumber, and when morning came, the great chief never awoke. Late one evening, Amanzi was on patrol, walking along the edge of the territory, checking to make sure that there were no threats to the tribe. In the distance, he heard the roar of a lion. He took off toward the sound, knowing the lion must be caught in one of the snares that had been placed around the perimeter. Once he reached the lion, he crouched low behind the bushes, eyes trapped on the animal. This one was massive, an adult male by the looks of it. The lion was whimpering in pain. Amanzi readied his weapon and moved out from the bushes. The movement of the man caught the lion's attention. He locked eyes with Amanzi, surprised at the feeling of familiarity, taking over the anger and pain. Amanzi? the lion asked in disbelief. Amanzi faltered at the sound of his name. How did this lion know him? There was something familiar about the lion, but he couldn't quite place what. Who are you? he asked begrudgingly. Amanzi, it's me, Zico, the lion said weakly. Don't you remember? Playing as kids? We were friends. You have to help me. Zico? Amanzi asked. It couldn't be. Amanzi couldn't help but think back to when he was a kid, laughing and playing in the tall grasses with his lion cub friend. Looking at the lion now, he was beginning to recognize the innocence of his friend from many years ago. Amanzi was still skeptical, and he kept his spear pointed confidently at the lion. His tribe was counting on him to be as great of a chief as his father was, his father who killed Zico's father. 
The thought of Papula filled his mind, seeing him on his deathbed and remembering the words he whispered as he lay dying. He looked at Zico. They weren't the eyes of a monster, but of someone he called a friend. This wasn't right. Amanzi lowered his weapon and said, I'm sorry, Zico. I know what you have come for, and I should kill you right here like you have you and your pride have done with our cattle. But but I just can't. Amanzi helped Zico out of the trap as painlessly as he could. There was a brief moment where Amanzi and Zico's eyes met. Feeling very grateful, Zico sighed out a quiet, Thank you, Amanzi. How has our friendship become so distant? Amanzi asked, with his hand covering his face. Do not blame yourself, friend, Zico said while weakly placing a large paw on Amanzi's back. My pride and I have done terrible things, things we cannot take back. But I promise you, I only did it for the sake of our cubs. Our lionesses would go far and wide in search of a good hunt, and return empty-handed. My pride was weak and hungry. The water holes were scarce, and the food was even scarcer. I did not know how else to keep my family alive. And the night my father died? Well, I grew angry with you, Zico exclaimed, while tears streamed down his face. Monzi slowly removed his hand. Those cows are how my father survives, too, and my family, and everyone else. This tribe has not seen times this bad since my great-great-great-grandfather were leader. You are not the only one suffering, Monzi explained with his head held low. I am so sorry, Zico explained. I should have come to you sooner, friend. We must figure something out. We cannot continue to make the same choices our father said, Amanzi said. There must be something, he thought. Aha! Amanzi grew wide-eyed. To find water for our cattles, we dig large holes. We use these holes as water for all our livestock. We dig you a watering hole close to your pride, and not only will you have water to drink, but it is sure to bring in other wildlife. Zebras, gazelles, you name it. Zico really enjoyed the sound of that idea, and he knew that where there was a watering hole, there typically was food. The idea seemed foolproof. He thought for a minute and then shouted with excitement, And the flashlight! You had it when we were young, remember? It scared me away. I will have my pride now look for food at the watering hole, but to keep them from returning, your tribe can line the fences of the fla with flashlights to shine at them. If they get too close, they'll be sure to run off. Zico and Amanzi were excited that they could come to an agreement. They were both willing to try to find a way the two communities could live in peace for the sake of their fathers and for the sake of their futures. That next week, Chief Amanzi put the tribe to work. While some people worked on the ingenuity of the flashlight design, others were digging up a large watering hole a safe distance away from the tribe. To their surprise, they found water in no time, and the flashlights were very useful in keeping wandering lions and even other scavengers away. The livestock were once again safe, and an easy everyday rhythm filled the tribe once more. Somewhere miles away, a clear blue watering hole full of cool water was surrounded by gazelle. Zico and his pride finally gained a place where they could eat with their fill without causing harm to the people, especially his friend Amanzi. That night, as the other lions were settling into a peaceful slumber, Zico stood on a rock perched above his pride and looked outwards. In the distance, amidst the twinkling of the stars, a white beam of light flickered against the darkness of the sky. Zico smiled to himself as he thought of his childhood friend. The air felt different now. At last, there was a hope for both communities, and even though they will live their separate lives, the two friends will never forget the memories they made in the tall grasses of the savannah together. If our story compelled you to want to get involved in helping to mitigate human and lion conflict, here's a few ways you can help. You can visit the African Conservation Center website and make a donation. The ACC and the Cincinnati Zoo also support a program called Rebuilding the Pride. You can purchase these beaded bracelets made by local Maasai women and the proceeds go directly to supporting their communities. Another program whose website you can donate to is the African Wildlife Foundation. With your help, AWF can continue working on vital programs like constructing BOMAs near national parks and conducting carnivore research to diffuse conflicts between humans and lions. The gift shop at the Columbus Zoo sells many fair trade items made by many different African tribes. The funds go to Partners in Conservation, which is a program that helps to support those whose efforts in conservation have been challenged by many different degrees.